Welcome everybody to the Eternal City. This is a random map with a very Roman theme, and there's quite a few things going on here, so let's try and break it down. All of the players in the game start out within the same walled city. There are several aqueducts that go from the outside of the map that feed into the city, and players can gather food from these. The aqueducts additionally act as a neutral wall, which separate players from each other on the outside. Players can continue to gather food from the aqueduct so long as it is intact. We'll notice when the aqueduct is broken, it doesn't matter which segment is broken, the entire thing will collapse, and once collapsed, players may no longer gather food from the aqueduct. And finally, in the center of the map, we have a monument that generates gold for the player which controls it, and players can take advantage of this so long as they defeat the legionaries which are guarding it. So let's get started on how to set this map up. So if we take a look, the aqueducts are very precisely placed. Uh, they start in the midpoints of the map square, if you want to call it, and in the corners and they go towards the middle and if we keep on generating they will always be there and if we want to say that the players are going to be directly in between the, the endpoints of this aqueduct uh, that would indicate that they would have to be very precisely placed which would indicate that we need a direct placement in this case So we have our player set up, direct placement, and direct placement maps tend to go hand in hand with our favorite map making utility, which is Madlands. So um, we take a look at this pattern here. We have basically a circle of eight points. The radius is 25 units away from the center, and if we want to consider that the aqueducts are going to be starting from the corners of the map like that and um, the edges of the map like that this offset of 22 and a half degrees will put the players right in between those so for the properties of these lands we're going to just say that the terrain type is mud the borders are 18 all the way across and the border fuzziness is 100 so fairly simple And for the base terrain of the map, I'm going to have it as DLC Gravel Beach. So if I were to go into like terrain generation, for example, and said create terrain, Base terrain DLC gravel beach. 100% of the land spacing to other terrain types is one. And what we basically have for us here is just this small little section of terrain which we can use to easily target walls. And since this is restricted for golds and stones, for example, if the players are spawning here, any player gold and stone that we create will never be able to spawn on the outside. So that's helpful. And just to give an indicator of where the players are, I'll just create a couple of player objects. So we can see that uh, when we keep on generating, they will always take the same spots, which would be right in between the aqueduct if we were to spawn it from the corners of the map to the center and from the midpoints of the map here to the center. And on the subject of how we're going to get those aqueducts in very precise positions, it's not completely obvious as to how that's done. At least it wasn't to me when I was making it. 
So let's uh, just try a couple things. So let's just go into the land generation first and we'll say create land. Terrain type is gonna be road land percent zero. Land position is gonna be one one. So we have one there, and we'll make a land in four corners. So we'll have 99.99. So now we have land in the four corners, and we'll put lands in the midpoints also. So currently we have lands in the corners and lands in the midpoints, which is effectively where these aqueducts are going to be starting. And let's say we had one more land, which is at 50, 50, which is going to be right in the middle. So if we were to try and connect all of these lands to the middle here, we can just try a connection generation section. the dry grass with dirt too and the terrain size can be very small so even though what this did for us was it uh, created this connection between this uh, neutral land in the corner and this land in the center here there's really no way to isolate this as its own thing without including connections to everywhere else because at the moment it's fairly clear that we're also connecting all of these lands on the outside as well as all these neutral lands to all the player lands which is making this very messy so connections aren't going to work very well And then perhaps we can try to brute force it by just using actor areas. So if I were to just draw a line from 0, 0 to 100, 100 with uh, actor area mode, let's see what this does. We'll say create object. We'll just use a relic as a placeholder. Number of objects will be a lot. And we'll say actor area to place in one, which is the actor area ID here. And we can see that this does a reasonable job for us here, but we gotta notice that since we're on a large map, each percent of the map's length is going to be slightly bigger than one tile. So as we can look and see, every so often there's a bigger gap than we would like. So if we were to place aqueducts instead of these relics here, they would be too far apart to connect with each other. And we could potentially increase the density of these actor areas to be closer together, but it's going to be very dependent on map size, and the amount of code that that would entail would be pretty extreme, especially when there is a simpler way of doing it, which I will demonstrate. So we'll just get rid of these over here. So for each of these lands in the corners, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them a land ID. Well, we'll just uh, take one to demonstrate for now. So I'll take this relic and I'll say place on specific
place on specific land ID 2. I'll say max distance to players is 0. So that just placed one relic on the origin of this land. And what I can do is I can place another relic, max distance to players 1. So as we can see, the second relic was placed directly diagonal of the first one, which is good. But at this point in time, we are not controlling where this relic can spawn as long as it is within one tile of this origin. So it could potentially be here, 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 anywhere along this box, which is one tile away. So what we can do is we can add this attribute which says find closest to map center and now we can generate generate again and the second relic will always be on this side diagonal of the first relic because it's trying to find the closest to the map center over here and we can try and repeat that with a couple more iterations. So this one was one tile away. This can be two, three, four tiles away. And they will all get placed in a line towards the map center. And if we were to give those same attributes to the lands in the other corners, now all of these are land ID 2, and they will all start to create these relics in a path towards the center. So now that we have that principle taken care of, uh, all that's left to do is figure out where they're going to stop. So to give us some indicator, what I'll do is I'll create where I want these lands to stop. So I'll say assign to player one and also give it a land ID so that they won't spawn player objects. And I'll also change their attributes so their terrain type is water with base size zero and number of tiles zero also. So essentially, I just want to keep adding objects to this chain until the last one ends up on this piece of water over here. So for this particular map size, it takes max distance of 68 to get it to the point where it goes from the corner here all the way to this little piece of water. And this isn't going to be the same for all map sizes. So for example, if I were to switch it to a smaller map, we can see that we overshoot this water by a little bit. So depending on how big our map is, we're going to need more objects or fewer objects. So in the end, what the code looks like is like this. So up at the top here, we define some cases. If our map is at least tiny, we're going to need at least 37 objects. If it's at least small, we're going to need at least 45 objects. And then the bigger the map size gets, the more objects we'll place, but it doesn't exclude any of the objects that were already placed when the map was smaller. So we can see that it's properly adapting to the map size here and on four player, etc. And that's also the reason why the land IDs of these uh, lands in the corners over here are going to be different from the land IDs of the ones uh, in the midpoints. Because the corners are going to be slightly farther away uh, from the center of the map than these midpoints would be. So we'll need a different number of objects. 
Okay, so at this point, I no longer need these lands of water to be uh, a visual indicator, so I'll just have them blend in with the rest of the terrain on the inside. And these lands, which are road, can be the same as the base terrain. So they will blend in nicely also. So at this point, we can try to switch out the uh, relics for aqueducts. So you can say, aqueduct is 231. And we can see that this didn't do what we wanted it to do. And that has to do with the fact that since aqueducts are a wall class object, when you place them with reference to a land ID, they will want to be placed in rings as opposed to as individual objects, similar to how walls are created on arena and fortress style maps. But that's not very difficult to overcome. So instead of just placing relics, we'll just place a placeholder. And if we notice that each of these placeholders has an actor area ID of 1 and a radius of 0, we can just place our aqueducts afterwards. So we say actor area to place in 1. And now we have each of these as a straight line from the uh, corners all the way to this midpoint between the two players. Now, a couple things that I want to mention is that I'm still keeping these lands here, uh, which are right below the aqueduct, even though they're not being used as a visual indicator. Since I have these assigned to players, these are technically going to be player lands, which means is uh, if I create any forest in the middle and give that the attribute of set avoid player start areas, that will prevent the forest from spawning too close to this aqueduct, which is uh, a positive thing. So speaking of trees, let's put those in there. So in the terrain generation section, We'll place Mediterranean Forest on the inside of the city with a small land percent and Pine Forest on the outside of the city with a larger land percent. So we put our forests in and immediately we can see that we're going to have a little bit of a problem here. Since the terrain of the uh, forest is generated before the object section takes place, it potentially gives us these breaks in our aqueduct. Um, and this is actually kind of significant because if we saw in the beginning, it shouldn't matter where we break the aqueduct, it's supposed to cause a chain reaction to break the entire thing. So that means if the aqueduct isn't continuous, that's kind of a problem for us. But this is not a very difficult thing to overcome. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say set the attribute of tree class to 3. So this is basically going to give us a blank forest terrain. This is going to be a fairly recurring theme. Um, so right now all the uh, aqueducts are able, are able to be placed properly. And what I can do after that is I can grab a Grab a terrain blocker, and then after we place the aqueducts, we can say create terrain, uh, create object terrain blocker, so 
basically create the terrain blocker because it's not restricted to being placed on ground terrain, which trees are. So we place that back on pine forest, and the second object is going to be a tree. So now we have our trees back, but importantly, they do not obstruct the path of the aqueduct from the corner to uh, the middle here. And then we can do a similar thing with the uh, forest in the middle. Mediterranean forest. And we can put olive trees on the Mediterranean forest. So now we have our, tr our forests on the outside and on the inside. And notably, since uh, these aqueduct locations are technically player lands also, we'll never have a situation where we have a forest spawning on top of uh, this aqueduct end. All right, so I've added a couple of things to the map. So I added the uh, midpoint aqueducts in addition to the uh, diagonal ones over here. And I've also placed this uh, shorefish underneath the end of the, the aqueducts over here. So the shorefish is going to be having a lot of food, so it will uh, supply the players for pretty much as long as they would need. And the radius of the fish has been slightly increased to be 1.5 by 1.5 tiles, just to uh, allow more villagers to be gathering from it at the same time. So the next order of business that I want to go through is how to make the aqueduct collapse when one of the segments is destroyed. So the concept of this is actually pretty simple. Basically when the aqueduct dies, it's just going to spawn a saboteur as, as its dead unit and the saboteur will detonate and damage the segment which is next to it. So a saboteur is object 706. So for all the Gaia saboteurs, I will set their hit points to zero so they die immediately upon spawning. Setting the blast level to zero and max range to two will allow it to damage friendly units in addition to damaging resources. Uh, notably, this is what's going to allow it to damage the shorefish. The saboteur's dead idea is building rubble, so the end result looks like building rubble even after the uh, saboteur dies. The blast radius is one, so it doesn't affect any larger of an area than the uh, segment next to the one that's currently being detonated. And then uh, modifying its melee attack to be zero, but modifying its bonus damage versus walls to be a lot, so it will be sure to destroy the wall segment without damaging any units that may be nearby. So what I'll do is I will say Gaia set attribute of the aqueduct set its dead ID to 706. All right, so we should be in a position where we should be able to test these effects to see if they're working properly. So now that we've launched a standard game, we can see that the aqueducts have generated as a neutral thing that uh, the player can attack. And once one segment is uh, dead, it explodes and it damages the segments which are next to it. So we can see that this looks like it's working reasonably well, except it's really slow because the dying animation of the aqueduct is just something that takes a long time. Uh, that's one of the problems that I have with aqueducts. And one of the other problems that I have is that an aqueduct does not have a building armor class. If we were to go into the advanced genie editor and look at aqueducts, they have 
melee armor, pierce armor, and latest attack armor. They don't have any wall class armor, they don't have any building class armor, which means any unit that would normally be doing bonus damage against buildings would not be doing bonus damage against an aqueduct. So for example, like petards and rams, they would be doing almost nothing to an aqueduct, which is rather counterintuitive. Now, the way we're going to address those particular issues is similar to the way we're going to get around some other issues that we may face in our map. If we take a look around the map, for example, we can see that most of the neutral architecture is Mediterranean themed. See the houses are a Mediterranean theme, the walls are a Mediterranean architecture. But if we look in the middle here, this monument is the graphics for Huns, not any Mediterranean sieve. So that may be a little confusing because normally the way we change building architecture for Gaia in maps is with the command set Gaia civilization. But that particular command is a global command. It's not a unit specific command. And that brings us to some of the newer unit attributes that can be modified in maps, which include graphics. So these over here are attributes that we can apply to units to change their graphics. So this is actually pretty helpful for us because uh, we can get around all the limitations involved with setting Gaia civilization uh, in the sense that they negate certain effects to be applied to Gaia units. And it also allows us to configure architectures independently as opposed to globally. So what I'm going to do, instead of placing aqueducts, I'm going to just place walls. So wherever I have aqueduct, I'll just uh, replace that with wall. So now that we're uh, using walls instead of aqueducts, you can see the destruction animation is a lot faster. And similarly with walls, they have the armor indices for walls and buildings, so they will take bonus damage from anti-building units. And in order to get it to look like an aqueduct, uh, what we have to do is uh, not very complicated. So we just say wall ATTR standing graphic. And then we take a look at the advanced gene editor for aqueduct and take a look at what the ID is for its standing graphic, which is 591. Now we're in a situation where the wall looks like an aqueduct, but it still has all the same properties of the wall. Um, so we have now a quick destruction animation instead of the long one. And we have all of the armor classes of the wall as opposed to the armor classes of the aqueduct, which are not intuitive. Now, you may have noticed when the Cobra cars were attacking the wall that the damage graphics of the aqueduct still looked like the damage graphics of a wall. Um, damage graphics are currently not among the uh, attributes that can be modified through scripting. Uh, so that's just one thing to keep in mind. But in our case, that's not really a huge deal. Okay, so the next order of business is going to be creating the walls around the city. So this is going to require a bit of trickery. Um, since if we look around, it should be fairly intuitive uh, what zone of the wall should belong to each player. So all of the wall from this aqueduct all the way to this aqueduct should belong to the gray player. Similarly, everything from here all the way to here should belong to the red player, etc. Now, um, it's important to know that we don't really have any discrete zone separation to be able to differentiate which zone actually belongs to each player. It's all basically one continuous thing. 
So the way we're going to do it is that the wall is going to be a Gaia wall, and when the game starts, the player in question is going to capture however much of the wall he's supposed to control. So let's walk through that. Um, so we're back in the object section, so we'll create object. So at this point, we've just created a bunch of wall segments. And right now, the wall is completely neutral. The way I want the player to capture it um, as soon as the game starts is I'm just going to put a temporary revealer as close as it can find to the player. So uh, let's grab temporary, temporary revealer, which is So set place for every player, find closest that is on DLC Gravel Beach. So you can see this box. Uh, this is where the flare got placed for the orange player, since this was the closest spot I could find to the orange player that was able to be placed on um, the Gravel Beach. Same for the gray player, that this is his flare. And then for the green player, this is their flare over here. You can see that line. And then all the players in the game should have their flare. So if we test the game at this point, we are controlling a section of the wall, but it looks like we are controlling more than we ought to, since um, there are since the segments on either side of the aqueduct are close enough uh, to be within the line of sight of the wall on the other side. Um, that is what's causing us issues right here. So. I want to make the capturable section slightly farther away from the aqueduct. So what that's going to require is an actor area. So this can have actor area two, actor area radius of two. And then for this capturable section, I want this to avoid actor area two. So effectively what we've done here is that since we place this off grid object in actor area one, Actor area one is the same line as these aqueducts, so it will be placed in line of the aqueducts on DLC Gravel Beach. So it basically is the intersection right here. So the capturable section will avoid that, so we're only capturing this part of the wall, and similarly all the other players have captured their respective sections. And then just to fill in these gaps over here, We'll just say set Gaia object only, set Gaia unconvertible. So the sections of wall which are remaining will not be capturable by players, but they will still complete the wall and make it so there are no gaps. But as of now, uh, there is no way to get out of the city without deleting your wall. Uh, it would be better if we could put gates here, so let's try and do that. 
All right, so let's qu quickly break down how we handle gates because we've done this in a couple of maps before. Um, so this is going to be before we place the wall segments, we're going to place uh, uh, placeholder objects on the gravel beach. This is going to be extra area for radius zero. And then another set of objects on the same place, but radius one. And then we'll take terrain blocker objects. We will place these in actor area five, which is radius one. And we will avoid actor area four and we'll put a second object flag A. So these are the terrain blockers which are going to restrict the placement of the gates. So it will restrict the gates to only being placed in the proper orientation. So we'll do create object fortified gate one. Set place for every player find closest. That also is on DLC Gravel Beach. So if we take a look at this, we can see that for the red player, this is pretty much the appropriate place to put this gate. Um, but for, and similarly for all the other players that spawn on this side, which would have a gate that's facing this direction. So this player, this player, this player, and this player, I'll get a gate placed properly there. But for these players on this side of the map, we don't want this gate placed. We want a different gate placed, preferably in this direction. So um, we just need to make sure that the max distance to players is within reason so that now for example this player cannot get a gate placed in this area because it would exceed the max distance and so all we need to do for those other players is uh, fortified gate 2 so now these players get a gate facing in this direction So when we bring the walls back, now each player is going to have a gate uh, fairly close to them to give them access to the outside of their section. Um, so that about takes care of the complicated things about this map. As we can see, I've updated a couple of things, including the objects, resources on the outside uh, and on the inside. Just a couple of things to note that um, this inner city which is road terrain can be done either with lands or terrains i happen to do this with lands because initially i was planning on elevating this i decided against it at the end but terrains would work also so long as there is a land at position 50 50 uh, to be able to reference the monument to so at this point cosmetically the city doesn't look very roman so, like I was alluding to earlier, similar to how we changed the standing graphics for the walls to look, to look like aqueducts, we can change the uh, graphics of all the other buildings to make them look more appropriate. So, for the monument, for example, if we were to go to monument and take the Huns architecture, the standing graphic is 6323, and that matches over here. And then for the houses, I would prefer these to be Mediterranean architecture. So I just select a civilization with that architecture set and we get standard graphics of, of 2226, which matches this over here. So now that updates the graphics of all of our buildings uh, to look more 
appropriate for the theme. Um, one other thing to note is that, let's see if we can, uh, the aqueducts themselves don't extend all the way to the edge of the map. Um, the reason for that is coordinate 100, 100 on a land will crash the game. So for the sake of symmetry, everything's 1% away from the edge. Um, it could be possible to just brute force this with actor areas to get those last remaining tiles, but it's not a huge deal to just um, cover it with something else. For example, just trees. So since these are all land origins, I'll just place 50 trees on each land. So they will just clump up and block the edges of the map um, and not allow units to pass around. Now, I know I didn't go into too much detail on how the players are set up for different configurations, different numbers of players, and how they're randomized, but I have other videos dedicated specifically to those topics. Um, and just in general, if I do something fast or don't explain something super well, it's usually because I've made other videos which involve that topic, and I try to link those when I can. But I think that's all I wanted to share with this particular map. So thanks everybody for watching, and I'll see you next time.